Let's play. I have an idea I'd like to explore with you. Let's pick up the fade out at the Stephanus 86 or in the low 296. And I imagine you'll find it. On page 596, 597. Oh, no, 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 no. Excuse me. No. 584 <clears throat> on the bottom. Page 5. How does it start here? Okay, and uh, it's a very famous. The argument of harmony is where we are. Let's take a look. Okay, try it this way. <laughs> Get the text for a moment. Okay. By the way, have you heard about the idea of reincarnation? <laughs> what arguments can you come up with against it? Right, think about it. Okay. What kind of arguments can you come up with? Make it as difficult as you can. Fun, that's okay. You gotta go back to it. So you gotta say hmm. Bases itself on the problem of multiplication, population growth. From that the reasoning concludes it is impossible. Right? Okay. 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 Another hand went up, please. Uh, well if there were if, if a Demi Ergos were to create uh, the cosmos with reincarnation, then uh, it might it might take away uh, inspiration for people to do good because they could always just pass it off to another life. Okay. Okay. Now, both positions hold to the notion that there is something called the soul. Yes. An individual soul. There's some kind of, in their both positions, it presupposes that reincarnation is possible, therefore the idea of soul is being assumed. Agree? Okay. Right. <clears throat> and your point is then that? Maybe there would, it would take away from motivation to do the good. Or right. to act on yeah. others' behalf. Right. No ethics possible with reincarnation. Huh? That would be your position. Okay, yes, please. Buddhist position, no self to reincarnate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the idea itself is what we do. Right, go ahead. Uh, it makes the assumption that the physical world is the only place the soul can develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the argument against reincarnation would be then? Uh, there are many other places for it to develop within itself. It doesn't need the physical world. There's no need for a reincarnation. There's no need for the physical world again. Oh, okay. Look here. No need for the physical world. <clears throat> What do you find interesting on the argument put forward by Sears? I'm talking about by Simmons. The harmony argument. What do you find interesting about it? Right, let's go, go to the text. What do you find interesting about it? Suppose it doesn't count that you can find it and restate it. Right. Right. And then you then just have to say what you think about it once you have it identified. Good? Go ahead. Anyone have an extra text? Extra text? Different text? No. Okay, anyone ready to play? I mean, three or four statements, what do you say? Someone want to volunteer for them?
jump in. Okay. I find it curious that uh, Simeus compares the soul to a harmony which is generated by physical things. And to give that idea of harmony all those names that, we, that Socrates was giving to the soul. Bodiless, invisible, all beautiful. Make some, some comment about it? You already, of course, made a comment about it, but want to add more to it or anything? Remember, you started that you find it curious that you could really find curious about it, and then that would tell me, wouldn't it? Good. What do you find curious about it? Well, that he, um, that, that he conceives of a uh, of the soul and harmony with all these great words attached to them <clears throat> uh, in such a fashion that uh, they end up being contingent or dependent upon the existence of bodily parts. Bodily parts. Got it? Okay, that's his statement. Got it? Keep it in mind. Okay. Next, someone else? I need three. Go ahead. To, uh, to the instrument of the heart and uh, the body to the soul, the, the heart to, to harmony and the body to the soul. The comparison he makes, and um, yeah, it, it just you know, phys phys physical um, damage to the heart can can harm it, achieve uh, reaching harmony. Mm -hmm. To go along with um, diseases and uh, other evils, which could be compared to a highly strong heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Third, and not someone else? He doesn't explain how the harp is tuned. Cool. First, make the statement about what you see as the statement of the argument, and then your comments. Satisfied with these two, or do you want to add to it? No. Well, the question I have from him is first, he, give, he gives harmony to the, to the liar, mm -hmm. but it's in, in, the, in the sense that he says it breaks it, that the harmony still exists, it just no longer is possessed in the liar. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, his, idea doesn't, uh, it's missing the tuning, it shows how you can destroy it, it shows, it shows how it perishes in this example, but it doesn't show how it's tuned, it doesn't show how the, how the liar is brought into harmony from, from the, the bodily art, it doesn't, there's a gap there, okay. but I don't see it, I, mean, I don't see it as, Okay, look, <clears throat> Plato is not a logician. He plays with analogies, concludes logically, but his thinking is all analogical. See? Okay, what does that mean? Well, 
only has to see when a person holds a position that behind any position, if you allow the person to talk about it, you're going to find there's an analogy behind it. Especially if you're talking about two things like soul and body. If they want to talk about soul and body, you're going to have to say something about the one and on the other. You have an analogy. Soul is to this, and body is to this. All that he's going to do is he's going to look at this and he's going to say, whatever you say about these two things, see, whatever, whatever you say, you may choose something else and put it in its place, it won't make any difference. He's going to say, how sound is your analogy? That's the whole study. Look, it's very easy to deal with this position logically. Very simple. He never does that. He argues against using a purely logical approach in philosophy. Again and again and again. That analogically it doesn't hold up because you can say that harmony comes out of the wire, but you can't say the soul comes out of the body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, let us assume we're there and you play that role with Socrates. You see, that would end it, wouldn't it? And say, hey, by the way, it doesn't fit, that's over. Yeah. Why doesn't he do that? He never does that. Right. Because um, the person obviously believes that the soul does come out of the body. So to, to just try to negate it, you're not gonna, they're not going to be able to escape from that view. Okay, the one I'm after. Okay, look here, what am I after? Nobody reasons analogically today. They don't know who wants to play this game. We want to see how he does it. It's easy to do it logically, as you just said. You can make fun of this. <laughs> he doesn't. He never takes it logically and takes an easy way out. Our model of reasoning is the, is the cross-examination. So let's go into this one quote. <laughs> I'm at uh, 86 BC, uh, pardon, near close to C. He makes his initial point exactly at 86. In this, that one might use the same argument about harmony and a liar with its strings. One might say that the harmony is invisible, incorporeal, very beautiful, right, and divine. And the well-tuned liar but the lyre itself and its strings are bodies and corporeal and composite and earthly and akin to that which is mortal. That's the first statement. He doesn't hold to that. And he expands it and shows that that isn't what he means at all. At sea. Let's watch it, okay? He assumes someone else is arguing, doesn't he? He says, let's suppose someone came along and argued this way. And this is the restatement. Notice the difference. That our body is strung and held together by heat, cold, moisture, dryness, and the like. And the soul is a mixture and a harmony of these same elements. What does he think of the soul? It's the same as the body. Same as the body. What the body's made up of, yeah. Hmm. That right? Yeah. You find that curious? Yeah. He doesn't make a distinction then. Not at all. And then he goes on, would you agree? Now, if the soul is a harmony, it's clear that when the body is too much relaxed, or too tightly strung by diseases and other ills, the soul must necessarily perish, no matter how divine it is, like other harmonies and sounds 
and all the works of artists and the remains of each body will endure a long time until they're burnt or decayed. Now what shall we say to this argument if anyone claims that the soul being a mixture of these elements of the body is the first to perish in what is called death? By the way, what's the distinction between the soul and the body as he unpacks it? It's made up of the same? Same elements. You find that curious? Yeah. Why? Well, <clears throat> he's not, he's, he doesn't think the soul exists essentially then. They're no different. Yeah. <laughs> no different. Agree? What could you say to him? What makes you think the soul is made up of what the body's made up of? Um, why are they different? As you said. Yeah, Did that end it? Yeah. That would end it. Because you're not making the distinction between the soul and the body if they're all made up of the same elements. You make sure of that right? Yes. Easy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now why does he go on for many pages? He doesn't do this. He never does that. Yeah, why? It's not about winning the argument. So we gotta see what he does with it. See, keep that in your back pocket and ask ourselves, and why is he doing what he's doing? <laughs> That's what we want to say. That's philosophy. The other is logic. Logic doesn't get you anywhere. Why? You know what? You're forced to see with analogy. With logic, you just see the conclusion and identity. A is B, right? All the other identities. No saying. Analogy, you have to make the connection, don't you? You have to see it. So then. Watch what he does. <clears throat> Notice, in his explanation, he adds to it, doesn't he? He adds to it, hey, with my theory, I can account for illness, mm -hmm. right, and other ills, right? And I can expand it, my idea of harmony, to other things and other works and sounds, and I can include the idea of artists, right? See what he's saying? He's making it, his, his view is expansive. But hasn't it? He's changed his position entirely, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could say to him, hey, dope, don't you know you've changed your position? Yeah. That's modern. Right, he's so foolish. <laughs> then we can have fun calling him a name, and he can have fun calling us names, and it gets nowhere. Mm -hmm. Let's see what he does. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, Socrates stops, and he says, okay, um, I've got your argument. Now, um, this is some of Now, let's get Seabees' argument. He stops. Now we get Seabees' argument. And that's where he picks it up at 87. Agree? Mm -hmm. Same thing now. Can you take a look at it and tell me what you see? And can you point out the similarities between the two?
Notice the difference between the two. One is a metaphor, one is a simile. One thinks in similes, one thinks in metaphors. Take a look. Someone telling me about Sebes' argument? Jump in. Go ahead. Well, he presupposes that the, the weaver had woven many cloaks, many cloaks, and mm -hmm. this is the last one where it could have been mm -hmm. one cloak he wore his whole life, and it would still, it would still be lasting after his death. Okay. Now you judge. Is that adequate? You judge the answer. Was that adequate? Did he put everything in words he needed? Right, he's looking at the same thing you're looking at. You find something he missed and ignored, take a look, right? Go back, take a look at your soul. Do you mention the word soul and body on the point he just made? Was that critical and important to it? Did he make a distinction? Okay, someone else? Jump in. Um, you make the, like, the comparison is between a human and a cloak and the soul and the human, which um, if you look at it that way, you, you're, make, you, you're saying that a human is comparable, comparable to the soul, which is kind of saying the same thing as the previous guy said. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. As you looked over it, how would you make a judgment to help the gentleman see more in the text than he's seen? Or would you say, no, that's perfectly adequate and represents the argument? No, just take a look from back and forth. Right? So you want to start a dialogue with the text. So you want to see the text, you have to get into it. So you have to find a nice juicy quote, then you want to look at it and see whether you can express it without distorting it, right? And then make a comment about it. See, those are the steps. So those are the steps. Got a quick good quote? Well, no, I was going okay. to say, okay. but I'd add that uh, it's, not, it's not a human that's, well, it is a human, but the key idea is a weaver. Mm -hmm. I mean, compared to the soul, the soul is a weaver of bodies, right? Except mm -hmm. it, it doesn't outlast the last one. So it's saying that the soul produces uh, body, like a, like a, like a weaver, like a weaver of, makes the clothes. Right? Okay, and now do you want to make a comment about it? No. 
Okay, okay, that's enough. Okay. One more? Same thing. Same thing, by the way. Yeah. I think it's odd yeah. that he asserts that the soul, when it finally perishes for good, must be the body of the soul. Because the body will actually die. So, is it likely that <coughs> just as Simeon made the statement and later restated it? you find that important when he restated it? Did he add something to it that gave greater depth to his original statement? Is it possible that it's equally true with CBs? Right, we can accept what was just said to very to various degrees. But then does he go on and add something to it that makes it essential? Or, no. Uh, would you not agree if someone scratches their head, they can be called upon repeatedly? <laughs> Do they both restate it? We found clearly Simeon did, didn't we? I'm raising the question, does Simeon do the same thing? Restate his own position. And in restating it, does he then add to it? And in what way? In Sufi's argument, how important is this little crazy little suffix? E-R. Okay. I'm exactly at the same place, I think, the number of your 87C. <clears throat> I think I may, like Simeon's, best express myself in a figure. It seems to me that as much as if one should say about an old weaver who had died, that the man had not perished but was safe and sound somewhere, and should offer as proof of this the fact that the cloak which the man had woven and used to wear a was still whole and had not perished. Well, now, interesting. What are you saying? Hey, look at this. You should consider this figure. Ah. You know, your disposition is, I'll tell you what it is. Um, I should say about an old weaver who had died that the man had not perished but was safe and sound somewhere. Why? I'd offer as a proof the fact that the cloak which the man had woven and used to wear was still whole and hadn't perished. There it was. I found his cloak lying there. That's the story, right? He's presenting a story, isn't it? A simile, right? It's so hard. Right? Life and death. I'll tell you what, it's like this old weaver, you know what? When he died, he perished, you know what? We think it's he went somewhere else because we could see after he died, he left his cloak and we could see it on the ground and therefore obviously he must have survived. Yeah, what the hell does... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> right, what does that do? It seems absurd. Well, yeah, it I mean, is. is that good? No. 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 Right, he says, that's, that's the way it is. Suppose someone would argue that way. He's got a good argument? <laughs> no. Okay, now he, rest in he restates it, so... He has to. Next paragraph. Uh, for the weaver in question wove and wore out many cloaks and lasted longer, he are, than they, though they were many but perished, I suppose, before the last one. Now, watch the, uh, 
The ER play itself out through this argument, right? Shorter time, longer time, weaker, stronger, ER, ER, ER. Yet a man is not feebler or weaker than a cloak on that account at all. And I think the same figure would apply to the soul and the body. And it would be quite appropriate to say in a like manner about them that the soul lasts a long time, but the body lasts a shorter time and is weaker. One might go on to say that each soul wears out many bodies, especially if the man lives many years. For if the body, body is, is, is constantly changing and being destroyed while the man still lives, and the soul is always weaving anew that which wears out, did he add something to it? Right? The soul is constantly weaving right? that which wears out. Then when the soul perishes, it must necessarily have on the last garment. And this only will survive it. And when the soul is perished, then the body will be at once its natural weakness will show itself and will quickly disappear and decay. Okay, I'm going down a couple of lines. The soul is naturally so strong that it can drum repeated births. Stronger, see? Even allowing this, one might not grant that it does not suffer by its many births and does not finally perish altogether in one of its deaths. But you know what? You can't argue that way. You say, sorry, right, right, right. What do you make of this? It's interesting. Look here. He's got a story, doesn't he? He's got a story. You have to, you have to put it in terms of the analogy, don't you? Go ahead. What do you find about it? So it was something that constantly weaves itself anew again and again and again. <clears throat> so he's saying, I'll take the idea of reincarnation. And each time it dies, right? It, it, here's the land of the dead. And it now weaves another body. And usually, according to statistics, it takes the soul about nine months to weave a new body. Which is why you know it's doing what I, it's necessary for it to stay on the womb for nine months, because that's time it's doing what? Weaving. It's weaving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to show off my medical knowledge. <laughs> hey, look. He's saying each one of these is like what? A new garment. Right, the coat, garment. Right? What's he saying the soul is like? The weaver. The weaver. And it lasts longer and it's stronger, but therefore it's just like the other, except for what difference? Er, er, er. How's that different than the other one? Is he assigning inequalities to the soul? No. He's not saying it's tied together by all of those elements <laughs> that that Simeon's used. He's just saying it's just like a what? A coat. So he doesn't give any properties to it, does he? Either the body or the soul. But this is it. This is a simile, right? That's what it's like. So now what does Socrates have to do? He has to now make sure he can express it in an analogical form. Okay, look here. <clears throat> Where now, then he goes, okay, at this point, that's puts it in analogical form. And then there's a whole bunch of talks. Oh my God, these, these two positions are attacking the very idea of reason and understanding. And then he comes back, and then he deals with this argument first of Caesar's. Then he takes on, right, Simeus and Caesar's, right? So, look here. So, this the body has a harmony, right? These are the two arguments you're going to go plow through. 
this is first, this is second. So what does he do after all of this discussion? He then goes back to Simeon's and shows the weakness in the analogy. That's all he's going to do. But he's going to expand on it. Look at what does he do? He does this first. Then there's an interlude. There's an interlude, one paragraph I'd like you to consider. What's the, rela what's the significance of these two positions of Cebes and Simeon to Socrates? What does he see in it? Well, let me, let me think that could be a theory. Um, okay. Jump to uh, 95. 95A. Very well on page 320, uh, pardon me, 327. 95A. Okay. Need a reader? Thank you. Well then, do we not now find that the soul acts in exactly the opposite way? Leading those elements? Okay. Very well said, Socrates. 327 on the bottom. Oh, very well, okay. Very well said, Socrates. Harmonia, the Theban goddess, has, it seems, been moderately gracious to us. But how, see? By what argument can we find grace in the sight of Cadmus? Good. What do you find in that? Simeus's argument is like what? Harmonia. Harmonia. And how is it described? A goddess. A Theban no, goddess. Where would that be, by the way? Thebes? What country? Greece. Maybe. Hmm. Okay, I'm not good at geography. Uh, what's the other term, by the way? Cadmus. <coughs> Cadmus. And that's linked with uh, Cygnus, is that right? And what? What kind of term? How does he describe them? He's familiar with these arguments, isn't he? He's saying, hey, you know, your argument, Simeus, very similar to what the Theban goddess, Harmonia, that's her name. As Cephas' argument is related to Cadmus. He's a god. He's a deity. And call legendary ancient kings too. Oh, by the way, uh, the images of Harmonia, what's sacred to Harmonia, even goddess, happens to be the liar. She's always pictured with lions, crows, and lions. And, uh, very interesting. By the way, this argument here, Cebes, happens to be the king. You know what he's found interesting is that in Thebes at this time, um, they saw the snake as central to the whole philosophy and religion of Thebes. <laughs> and they used to have this position that as the snake sheds its skin each year, so does man shed his body and his soul is very much like the snake that survives each change of clothing. Do you find anything curious about that? The snake is like the weaver. Huh? The snake is like the weaver. Oh, really? Yes? Yeah. Oh. Hey, wait a minute. Then he's taking in these two positions the paramount 
religions of his day in Thebes, isn't he? He's pointing out, hey, I know you guys. Hey, I know you guys. This is where your religion comes from. What's he doing to their religion? Challenging. So in the modern world, a philosopher, they're going to be similar to what Socrates is doing. He may take on the Christian belief or the Hebrew belief or whatever it is, agree? And he would be doing something similar if he could find what? From them, draw a position out, see whether it expresses an analogy. Then you do the similar job that he did on Cebes and Simeon, analogically. You do on contemporary religious figures, and you'll be doing something similar, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Curious? Yeah. Huh. Well, I thought we'd just spend a little time on that. Before we <laughs> Find that interesting? Yeah. Okay, next time. Okay, look here. <clears throat> Tell me all the steps. Would you just send me us next time? What does he do? Why does he go to such an alignment? Look at what he does. Look what he, Socrates, look what he includes in it. Why does he do it? Because when he's finished, it's over. What does that mean? Look here. In the Theotetus, what does he do in the Theotetus? All is relative. Hey, very simple to smash that argument in a couple of good sums if you want to do it justly. He doesn't do that. He pulls out what's involved in it. It's role in society. It's cosmological view. It's, it's theological understanding. He brings out everything that's connected with it. And it's only then that he's willing to take it on and show the falsehood of it. So he's not just reducing an argument to its absurdity. He wants to say the whole culture with him. So he's deconstructing that culture's pathologos. Yeah, there it is. That's how you do it. Yeah. Okay. Next week. <laughs>